ladies and gentlemen, I should say colleague, colleagues, uh, welcome to this uh, lunch seminar. Um, we're going to talk about sustainable development goals. And of course, this is for an institute like ours, a very important uh, topic. Not only as a uh, subject of our uh, teaching and our research, but also because the sustainable development goals provide a framework of all the activities that we do and how we prioritize them in our strategy. So we're going to talk about uh, sustainable development goals and we're very happy to, uh, to have Professor Stefan Ullenbroek with us, who is the uh, UNESCO Director of the World Water Assessment Program in the lovely town of Perugia, Italy. Uh, Stefan is also a professor attached to uh, us in the uh, chair group Hydrology and uh, Water Resources. Um, and I think uh, I would like to invite you to give us the presentation. The title will, is already mentioned there, yeah? it's about uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, how do they contribute to the uh, 2030 agenda? What's the uh, state of affairs and more particularly what are the knowledge gaps so the floor is yours thank you johan colleagues ladies and gentlemen pleasure to be here now when i put this literally this slide together this morning and i we had a, a celebration last night because one of our pg students graduated and i i put uh, well, of course, that's my, my main, and I completely forgot to put IHE there, <laughs> which is, I don't know what happened there, so my, my apologies, and uh, of course I'm affiliated to UNESCO, uh, to IHE Delft, and uh, I will uh, put that next time also on my first slide. Um, I want to speak about the, the need for science for uh, achieving the SDGs, particularly SDG 6. Um, what is the best way to click this? So you do it here, I think. A few words. Yes, of um, well, what WAP is doing, the World Water Assessment Program, it's part of UNESCO. Uh, and and th we, this little cartoon shows it all. The, the, we try to look at water problems from different uh, angles, different perspectives, and trying to shed some more light. And, and also try to translate the science that many of you in the room are doing for uh, a policy and decision maker audience. So all our reporting is, is largely uh, not so done, uh, the reports are not so much for scientists, but uh, more for uh, so-called policy and decision makers. Therefore, um, we, we also developed a, uh, as a good UNESCO program, a UNESCO temple with our strategy. And the three main activities we are doing is creating evidence-based knowledge products, like the World Water Development Report, the SDG reports we have been uh, doing. Then we work in this transdisciplinary research projects or, or impact projects including water and gender. For people working in that field, I would like to announce that next week, uh, in two weeks, we will launch the next uh, toolkit for sex disaggregated data uh, measuring for in water management. And that's a very interesting tool also for if you work more in social sciences in your, um, in your dissertations. And number three is we work on science policy dialogues where we uh, bring together scientists and uh, policymakers and uh, discuss what needs to be done. That's also what I'm personally quite involved in. Our main product is the World Water Development Report. That's this annual report nowadays. I put the line there to, to distinguish from the first couple of years when it was a um, quite comprehensive review document. I think the last version had more than 900 pages. And then it was switched to an annual report, a thematic report, always on different topics. And I, I got involved in this with the first report in 2016 on water and jobs. And since then, we published a report on wastewater, which was launched in Durban, South Africa, and then nature-based solutions, where also IG colleagues contributed um, quite a bit. And also, this year, we launched the report Leaving No One Behind, which we, uh, was actually launched at the Human Rights Council in Geneva in March, earlier this year. But I will not speak, you, you have to invite me again if you want to let me speaking about the World Water Development Report. Today, I want to speak about the SDGs. I'm mainly speaking for the students. I, I see many, uh, it's very nice to see so many colleagues, former uh, uh, direct colleagues when I was a staff member here directly. Uh, you know all this, but, but maybe for the students, you know. You, I, I hope you're all in kind of aware of this. And which is the most important goal? Tell me. All of them. Good. Number one. Okay. Okay, no, nobody says water, that's already suspicious in this institute, but... 
What is the most important goal when, for kind of from a development point of view? What would you think? If you, you, are, you are in charge of country X, and which is uh, one of the least developing country, least developed countries, and, and you want to make a difference, what, what do you think? What would you? Four. Sixteen. Ten. Good. Democracy sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. So, and the same question was asked to uh, leaders. And uh, that was a, a study done by the World Bank, and it's, I, I haven't seen the final report. This is kind of a world uh, and work in preparation, which I received end of last year from a World Bank colleague. They were asking leaders, and they, you know, what is the most important goal in multiple uh, ticking boxes was, was, was possible if, uh, for, for development priorities? And number one is quality education, second was peace and justice, and the third one is uh, decent work and economic growth. Yeah. Yeah, these three were the, the top, and then the others came. Water is um, here somewhere, and if you think of that responsible consumption and production, I believe there's also an important goal, but it's, it's down there. And the, the last one is the ocean goal. Only 3% considered ocean as, as a development priority in their country. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting is also if you separate these leaders into different groups. So they were asking leaders from government, development partners, civil society or uh, non-governmental organizations, and private sector. And it was always quality education first, peace and justice, and uh, growth and jobs. And for the private sector, also infrastructure was then considered as, as a very important priority. Yeah? Hmm. Does it make any sense? There's such a ranking. Is that, is that meaningful? Yeah? I, I'm actually very critical, because consistently, oceans is always the last one. You know? <laughs> Does it mean oceans are not important? Uh, Professor Rainer Singe maybe is not really in agreement with me. But I, I, I couldn't agree more that, of course, it is, um, uh, it's not about ranking goals. No, I really believe this is actually misleading. It is interesting to look at this and ask yourself these questions, but um, I, I, I believe that it's, I followed this, this uh, diagram that the uh, Resilience Center in Stockholm uh, was, was publishing a, year, a bit more than a year ago, I think, that there's, they call that a wedding cake. You know, you know what a wedding cake is? You know, when I got married in Germany, so we got a, a big wedding cake. And uh, it's not only about the cream. No, it's about all the different layers. Yeah? And it's not that the one is more important than the others. You need a good basement. And the basement is the goal for uh, terrestrial ecosystems, oceans, climate, and water. Based on that, they put the societal goals and the economic goals. Goals. And they're all interconnected, and the size of the slice is not kind of indicating this is more important than the others, but we cannot afford to, to miss out on the one or the other. It's not that oceans are not important. Maybe for a land, landlocked country somewhere, it's, it's not a development priority, yes, but, but it's not, um, it, it's the concerted um, effort to, to, agree, to, to reach all of them. So that's, I think, the important part. And I believe this is a more useful way than, than ranking them like this. Good. After this, um, the, every year, I think one of the key lessons learned from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals is that they said, well, we need to continuously observe where are we with these goals, you know, where are we making progress, do we need to readjust our policies, etc. To do that, they agreed on, a, on an indicator framework in a performance management system, you need indicators, and some 230 plus indicators were agreed on, mainly led by statistical offices, the indicators, so we come to them later. And, uh, and, and every year they meet at the high-level political forum in New York, where the senior representation of government is meeting, and they say, oh, you know, are we making progress? And last year, the water goal, our goal, was, was on the agenda. It was one of the goals to investigate. To inform that process uh, in 2018, uh, no, quickly, Talking about the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, the focus on the Millennium Development Goals was very much on water supply and sanitation. Therefore, you see a pit latrine there and a, a well, and on developing countries. Yeah? Well, the SDG agenda is a much, much more comprehensive, much wider agenda. It's not only water supply and sanitation, no. It is also other aspects, water use efficiency, water quality, uh, water management aspects, ecosystems, water dependent ecosystems. So it's a much more comprehensive agenda, including aspects of cooperation and participation. So it's not only the wash part, which, which no doubt it's important, but that was very much the focus. Now we have a much more uh, integrated agenda, but I believe it's a game changer because the, the, the complexity of water is, is considered in a, in a much better way than, than this focus on water supply and sanitation only. 
I mentioned this uh, meeting in New York last year. There, the, uh, the governments were discussing where are we with water. To inform that process, um, we put together the so-called SDG 6 synthesis report. It was a UN water task force uh, that, that put that together. I was coordinating that the last three years. And there were some 14 organizations uh, put together. You know, I, I manage a family with three children. I found this is challenging, but 14 UN organizations agreeing on one report. You know, that, that is really, I, I think I lost some sleep and uh, some gray hair. But, uh, but, it, but it was an interesting uh, exercise. And that was also then the only report from the whole UN system which was presented to the member states in New York and was, uh, was discussed there. It's summarizing with all these different indicators. We had some 90 plus maps with uh, all sorts of indicators, some you will see in a minute, showing where, where we are with SDG 6. Are we making progress? And are we making progress in the right direction? And also, what are the interlinkages between water and all the other goals, ecosystems, climate change, and gender equality, etc., etc.? And what are the key policy recommendations? So what can we offer to the world? Um, what needs to be done to, to, to achieve this important goal? So I was standing there in New York, and we were proudly holding up this report, 200 pages, a lot of statistics and maps, and, and I don't know, some 70 people contributed as, as authors, uh, co-authors uh, to this report. And you know what the most popular was? It was a two-pager. We called that the highlights. It's a two-pager, and it's very much in layperson's language, trying to summarize what, what does the report say. That was the most popular document. Really, I, I saw everybody taking it. It was also helpful if you have a camera in front of your face, and sometimes you need some wording for, for, for a general public, and, and I found this a very, high, uh, very useful document. Everything is on the internet, including my slides and all these reports and highlights and, and, in many different languages, by the way. And the main message is, the world is not on track. If we continue as we are doing now, we will not achieve SDG 6 you know, by 2030. It's a beautiful objective, but uh, we, will, we will not get there. That's the main message. Sometimes we're making good progress, but the progress is not fast enough. So we, we, we run in the right direction, but we don't run fast enough. You know? Sometimes we really run in the wrong direction and we really need a, a completely a shift in what we're doing. If you look at the degradation of ecosystems, it's really going the wrong direction. You know? It's not a question like in water supply and sanitation, we connect more and more people, which is a good thing. But uh, sometimes we really go in the wrong direction. Uh, in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so, or a bit less, I would like to just share a couple of main messages of this report and always illustrate that with a couple of key figures uh, why, why we say that. The first one is, for, for you uh, colleagues, maybe a bit trivial. It's, uh, Achieving SDG 6 is essential for all the others. So water is an enabler to make progress in economic growth, in uh, uh, climate action, in achieving quality education, gender equality, sustainable energy, etc., etc., and vice versa. Yeah. It's a bit trivial for you because you, you probably understand that, but, but if I speak to uh, non-water uh, experts like yourself, this is kind of an aha erlebnis, erlebnis we, we call that in German, like, like somebody, oh yeah, it's actually true. Huh? The critical role for water in job creation, for instance, is often completely misunderstood and underestimated. Huh? So, but but that's kind of that's we illustrate with a couple of facts, and we we uh, we show why water is so central. A couple of, of uh, illustrations on that. That's the connection between water, energy, and uh, social equity. And you see the situation in 2000, and we plotted on the y-axis the um, access to electricity, on the x-axis access the access to basic water. And you see in 2000 and in 2014, uh, so at the end of the Millennium Development Goals, countries develop. Every country is a bubble. The bigger the bubble, the larger the population. So you see India and China as two of the bigger bubbles, because the, the size of the population is so large. So it's kind of a movement to the top right, which is good. More and more countries um, are better, better connected to water and sanitation. But there's a race to the top, but on the other hand, there's certain countries left behind. And all these are, the blue one, are sub-Saharan African countries, huh, where we're still lagging behind significantly in access to electricity as well as to water, or basic water. And we plotted that for many other parameters. Oh, how everything is connected is the virtual water, and you know that uh, the pro to produce the products is uh, um, which we consume, which we eat, which we wear. The clothes I'm, uh, the clothes I'm wearing today, all the cotton, you know, the growing of, of this cotton probably was uh, much more water, much more water was needed than I was drinking the last 20 years. So, you know? so it's, it's really the, 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 the footprint we have to our uh, consumption pattern 
in water is uh, very significant. And this is illustrated in this map, uh, this virtual water trade for the Latin American region. And you see how, how um, the different uh, commodities are uh, also having a virtual water trade from the Latin America or to the, to the region. Again, this is for uh, people just to illustrate how everything is connected. Second main message is, um, while there has been a lot of progress during the Millennium Development Goals when it comes to reducing the inequalities, we have to, to conclude that the inequalities are on an all-time high at the moment. Yeah? An example, what you see there, we plot the GDP as an indicator for the, for the size of the economy of a country versus the, uh, the population connected to safety managed drinking water. And it's always the same. The richer countries are bet much better, better connected. If you plot basic drinking water or safe drinking water or sanitation or whichever parameter, it's very clearly, uh, the, the message is, is very clear. It's un, very unequal around the world. Uh, while water, having access to water and sanitation is a human right, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a benchmark decision by the General Assembly from 2010, uh, which, which really defines the human right. And that, that, is a, that was a, a game changer as well, because it's, it clearly defines the role of the duty bearers, the states, to, to provide their people with uh, water and sanitation, but it also defines the rights of the right holders, all of us, every individual has the right to to uh, clean drinking water and sanitation. Well, having a human right is a good thing, but it doesn't mean in reality that this is uh, the case because when you look at uh, safely managed drinking water, it's 2.1 billion who lack safely drink uh, managed drinking water. It's three out of 10 lacking that. And 160 million use directly surface water, scooping surface water for their basic uh, water, drinking water supply. This is the map for basic drinking water and you see the yellow countries which are lagging behind. If you do safely managed drinking water, which is the, the objective of the SDG, you see many countries became gray because we don't have data, uh, but you, you still see uh, where, where the problems uh, are. This is for drinking water. Uh, inequalities also related to gender, I think this is well known in this. Well, we from the UN, you know, we often have these global maps and we color code countries, you know, so, well, yeah, South Africa is yellow and, I don't know, Mozambique is uh, light green or, or whatever. But having that, it is also very important to, to look at the inequality within the countries. Example from sanitation, what you see here is the, the distribution of basic sanitation and what we... Um, I didn't bring a point, but it doesn't matter. What, what we see here is that 70% of the world is, has access to basic sanitation, yeah? So shared facilities, etc. If you look at Latin America and the Caribbean, you have everything between 30% and 100%, depending on which country you, you look at. If you look at Panama, a relatively uh, industrialized country for Latin America and the Caribbean, the average is 80%, but you have everything between 30% uh, and 100%. There's huge difference for the urban and the rural population, for the rich and the poor, and for different municipalities. So it's, it's not about giving Panama or any country a, a number. It's really about understanding the, the inequalities within the countries, understanding the regional uh, and societal uh, um, differences that are there with access to all these things. Sometimes inequalities are uh, at very close proximity. This is an irrigated golf course near Durban in the Chanty town with uh, hardly any access to, uh, or no access to safe water and, and, and sanitation. So the inequality is, is, a, is a huge thing. Not having access to water and sanitation is, is, is a bad thing. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's also very unhealthy, and it really uh, impacts uh, development in many ways. What we plotted here is the proportion of children stunted, so they are physically behind in their, their development, and the uh, proportion of children stunted under five. And we talk about, this is an important thing, in, in, in India it's more than 30% of the children under five are stunted. And uh, we plotted here against the GDP, obviously the richer the countries, the, the less children are stunted. Stunting depends on many things, not only on water supply and sanitation, it depends on food security, on uh, deficiency of, of, of nutrients, micronutrients, um, uh, health care, on, on many things. But also on water supply and sanitation, what we color-coded here is the access to uh, basic sanitation. And the lower the access to basic sanitation, the, the larger the proportion of children stunted. And you, you have more or less the same pattern if you, uh, if you plot other parameters as well. 
And it's not only that the children are physically behind, these are brain tissues uh, from, from, uh, uh, the brain, uh, from the brain of a normal child versus a stunted child, and you see the branching is completely different. So it's not only that they are shorter, it's also their human capacity is already uh, limited in the development. So, so how can you ever get out of poverty and all these problems if, if uh, even the, the brain at the very early child age is already uh, impacted? And it has huge implications for society. Often the, the number of people affected by conflicts is making it to the news. Globally, we have 65 million who are directly impacted by conflict, yeah, directly. If you look at the people connected, excuse me, affected by droughts and flooding, it's much more. Yeah? It's twice as many people are uh, almost by flooding directly impacted. Indirectly, we all are impacted by flooding. Yeah? Or if you look at the people killed, 75,000 people every year on average are, are um, or uh, die because of a conflict situation. 75,000, that's too many, it's terrible, yeah? But look at, look, look at the people are dying because of uh, inadequate uh, water and sanitation, it's more than 10 times as much. You know? It's a really, it's a silent tsunami. Every day, more than 1,000 children dying because of diarrhea, like a, a, a very preventable disease. Yeah. These are dramatic numbers, but they don't make it to the headline news anymore. We are kind of, I'm sure you, you had this in your first lectures, and we just accept this, you know, and also our society. So I used these slides when I recently I was speaking at the European Parliament again, with exactly that slide, and said, well, you know, this does make it to the headline news, but these are the real, real problems as well, which are too accepted in our society. Economic uh, damage is also dramatic when it comes to water. I don't need to explain that further here, but the numbers are difficult to assess. Huh? Last message. Um, uh, uh, no, no, I have two more. Open defecation. The objective in the Sustainable Development Goals is to end open defecation. Open defecation is uh, maybe not only not a nice thing to do, it is, uh, it is terrible for the health. People are much more exposed to um, uh, health issues through, through open defecation. And it's, it's also a, a question of dignity that, that you know, if you don't have access to any toilet, and in particular for women in, uh, in the southern, some southern countries, it's also a question of, of security because if they have to go out in the middle of the night to do the business, then it, it can be, they can be uh, exposed to, to violence or, or other problems. So the objective is to end open defecation. Let's look, are we doing, are we doing fine? Are we, uh, will we end open defecation in the coming years? What you see here is different regions and the largest burden is for Central and Southern Asia and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And you see that the numbers are going down. Yeah, so it's kind of almost a linear trend. So, so over the last 15 years, there has been progress in uh, reducing open defecation. But I, so it's almost embarrassing with so many professors and uh, PhD and master students. I, I did a very simple, simple thing. I didn't have the numbers. I did just linear interpolation on the PowerPoint slide with some dotted lines. Students don't do that. Yes, <laughs> your professors will not accept. But if you're a professor yourself, you can do. But. Uh, <laughs> You, uh, what we see, the numbers are going down, and if you assume a kind of a, a, a linear extrapolation, it's, it's not zero. It doesn't go now. We need to run faster. We need to really reinforce our efforts if we want to end open defecation by 2030. Yeah? The numbers do not go to zero, so it's really time to act now. So it's not a question. So we're doing we're on the right track, and we just continue doing. No, we have to speed up. Yeah? We really have to accelerate our action. I can give you as many, many more examples. Um, this is a bit complicated. This is a, a figure from the GMP program. That, uh, that we plotted the countries that do not have basic access to water, uh, less than excuse me, uh, less than ninety-five percent coverage. And then, if you assume that the last fifteen years, you know, the progress, the rate of change of the last fifteen years is a good indicator for the next fifteen years to be extrapolated linearly and say, well, if the rate of change continues for countries like Laos, Morocco, Mongolia, Sri Lanka, they will have 100% access to basic drinking water. Yeah? But if you, uh, globally, only one out of five, excuse me, four out of five countries are not on track. They're not uh, get providing the access fast enough if they continue with the same rate of change as in the last 15 years. If you look at basic sanitation, it's only one out of 10 countries that is actually on track. So there's improvement, but not fast enough. Urban, urban drainage, a number of colleagues are wor working in that field, and what, what is plotted here is the, uh, the connection of uh, sewer systems in urban areas over the last uh, 15 years. 
And you see on the right, on the right axis, uh, there's an increase in urban sewers in all these countries, which is a good thing. Better, better urban drainage, including wastewater uh, management, so it's a good development. On the y-axis, we plotted the degree of urbanization in different countries. And you see the green countries are doing well. They improve the urban sewer network, and they do that at a much at a faster speed than the urbanization. The yellow countries, they have more urban sewers, but actually urbanization is at such a pace, you know, such a speed, it's outpacing the, the increase of connecting people to urban sewers. The red countries are going the wrong direction anyway because they, they have less and less connections. So you see, again, Many, so it, it's a negative connection. Huh? So maybe some of you say, well, that urban sewer, Stefan, is that, is that the right thing? So maybe we have to think of decentralized solution or other ways to, to manage wastewater as well. So the connection to urban sewers only is, is not the way. And if you look like uh, some, some cities like Laos or so, you have like 20 million people and only 5% of the wastewater is actually collected and treated. And 95% is discharged somehow, you know. So having this kind of uh, European centralized urban sewer system will never work there. To retrofit that city will not work, and that's true for many developing countries. So maybe maybe other innovations uh, from you are, are more effective to, to achieve these SDGs. Uh, I think I should stop in five minutes or so. Yeah, if I, then we have some answer questions. I think this is kind of. Uh, uh, well known. I want to, want to come to uh, uh, water use efficiency, which is one of the indicators. I promised some world maps. This is uh, uh, an indicator to, to measure the water's use efficiency for countries. You know, with all the wisdom we came up with this indicator, I was not personally involved, so I can, I can say that, but it's the, uh, the gross value added per unit of water. So if you use an additional cubic meter of water, what does it mean for the economy? Yeah. And that's, that's the way to measure that. And then you come up with a, with a map like this. And then countries who are super water use efficient according to that are Luxembourg or Qatar. But these are countries that are not very much dependent on agriculture, which is the biggest water use, as you know. Uh, they are, like, Luxembourg is uh, hardly irrigating at all, but it's basically getting its wealth through uh, service sector banking in particular, Qatar through oil and gas. So, so you, water use efficiency, if you average it for the whole economy, is not a very good indicator, you know. But, but that's the official indicator. Of course, we reported that, we have to do that, but we also critically discussed uh, what are the more meaningful indicators. And I, I'm happy to share this result from a colleague from, uh, from Italy. He, he does that with a raster-based model globally and simulates water use efficiency. And you see then the country of India on the left side is then a much more diverse pattern. And you see water use efficiency and uh, varies a lot per pixel scale. And, and I think we can do that uh, with, with more advanced uh, water accounting and, and other uh, tricks from Professor Solomatini and others to, to have a much more distributed uh, approach to, to that as well. And the lower is even separating agriculture on the left-hand side versus um, service sector and, um, and, 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 and industry. Uh, so, so you see, it's, it's super important to separate different main economic activities and not just put that all together. I closely come to, my, to the last part of my talk and I my, my job is to, of course, overseeing the, the production of these products, these reports that we are doing, but also disseminating. So I often give lectures at, also at parliaments. And we had now four times at the European Parliament a session on the World Water Development Report and, and others. So it's kind of this dissemination policy outreach is, is I believe, an important part. And um, so instead of only talking the talks or walking the walk, what needs to be done, and I promise some reflections on on research directions, what I believe, and I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to the discussion now, what you believe, what needs to be done better. And I believe these interlinkages are, are very important, and we need to quantify them much, much better. We need to develop better indicators, I think, for the water use efficiency, that's very clear. And, and there's others as well, but I really believe we need to understand beyond the storytelling uh, that water and gender is an issue. You know, we need to be quantitative and also be in deterministic models to be able to describe that. I also believe that we need truly transdisciplinary projects, so like interdisciplinary, but also involving stakeholders, really from the beginning. So that's how transdisciplinarity is defined, and I, I believe that this is, um, this is an important step that we need to do. Well, well, by putting a lot of data together, I still believe we need more and better data. We really need to utilize the latest uh, um, Earth observation techniques, citizen science, etc., private sector data. There's so much which the UN is not utilizing. 
some of the colleagues and say, oh, no, it's not coming from the statistical office of the country. We cannot use this data. And so, well, which which may, maybe is true, but on the other hand, we need to inform policy and decision making. It's not only about kind of uh, which we're allowed to use. We need to come up with better ways to inform what is the situation. Yeah? But just color, color coding countries and giving them blue or yellow or green, you know, is, is part of the story. Yeah? Therefore, I believe uh, research from your colleagues is uh, very important. And I also believe that new methods are uh, analyzing all this data, big data, maybe trade data and other other data which we usually don't use in water uh, so much and with some blockchain technology we don't, don't understand the math but maybe Dimitri explains me that one day and it's really about understanding transactions of water and maybe in a much more distributed fashion than, than, than we were able to monitor maybe these type of developments really help us to gain much better insights uh, in water and uh, I, I would be very pleased to listen to you if you work on these type of topics internet of things is, uh, is another one more data are said that, and that hopefully leads then um, to more integrated science for development, which I believe is, is an exciting part, which IG is working on, and I'm happy to still be part of it, to support evidence-based policy and decision-making, and then to make a difference. And my last graph, uh, this was from a study from a rainwater harvesting uh, study in, um, in Eastern Africa, I think Ethiopia, a different funded project. They were, they were mapping the effort in terms of uh, time and money going in, into that rainwater harvesting study and you see how much is spent on field work and how much is spent on data analysis, technical reports and knowledge sharing and, and the last one is advising the client, what you could call kind of policy outreach, you know. And uh, think about your own project, how much effort do you put on that last uh, last bar and uh, don't, don't take it as an afterthought that you feel like, uh, okay. Now I did my research and I start talking to, to policy makers to actually do something with it. So we really have to rethink. And if your research plots also like this, um, maybe your, your impact could be improved. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Stefan, for the uh, interesting presentation. Um, I read we're still in uh, dire straits. Um, Let's see if there are some uh, indications of uh, what could be uh, good directions forward or other questions from the audience. Um, you may throw the microphone. Okay. I can do it. <laughs> so who has a question for you, Stefan? Was I not clear enough of this? Can I throw so far? Sure, sure. <laughs> you should. Oops. Oh. <laughs> Just shout. Okay. So, uh, can you stand up? Thank you very much. Could you stand up? Um, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I have a question because, um, you know, the availability of water is changing, and now with climate change, it's even more like, feasible in some places. Uh, how do you think this connection about uh, SDG number six and everything that we have to achieve? with the climate change, UN climate change um, agreement. For instance, uh, because the, the Paris Agreement, uh, there's a lot of countries, the big countries that are under trouble. So how do you see that in this uh, scenario of achieving this goal? Because uh, water availability is affected by climate change. Um, how do you see this in the big picture? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I have 15 minutes to answer that question, isn't it? <laughs> um, it it's, uh, it's very important. Climate change is changing a lot. But, uh, you know, often there's these stereotypes. Now it's getting more water and getting less water, you know. I, I didn't expect her question, but I, I used this. I, I recently talked about climate change and I still had some slides. I found this a very interesting figure. This is the average of 18 uh, GCMs, some of the best GCMs we have at the moment. Uh, GCMs simulate the climate model. Professor Ranasinghe can explain everything about this. And then um, it's, it's one of the scenarios, and it's the uh, trend from 2010 to uh, 2100. You see some areas, there's a good uh, agreement that it's get wetter, like uh, parts of uh, Eastern Africa or the uh, human tropics in Southeast Asia, it, um, according to this graph, and others become drier, for instance, the Mediterranean and some other areas, so, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa seem to become drier. What I found most interesting, if you take one of the GCMs, you always get a different pattern. 
the shaded black area is where 80% of the models are in agreement with the direction. Yeah? There are some areas which is not have these shaded, this black, black shaded area where, where we don't know it's getting wet. And this is only annual mean precipitation, not talking about interesting parameters for hydrology, you know, like the daily maximum drought, number of uh, uh, dry days and dry spell, and then, you know, kind of interesting statistics. So this is only the annual maximum, uh, excuse me, the, the annual uh, precipitation. And you see, in 30% in of the globe, we don't know in which direction it goes, even with the annual rainfall. Yeah. So there's a lot of uncertainty in this. On the other hand, we do realize that the climate is changing and we need to, we need to advise governments and we need to work in our own countries or with other governments to kind of adapt to something which we don't know in which direction it goes. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. I also don't say that it's, it's uh, climate change, we, it's, we don't know anything, we don't, should do anything, but, but some areas we, we seem to have a better, our models you know, have a more better agreement, but it, it shows a lot of uncertainty and it shows the space in which we have to work with adaptation measures. Yeah. But to answer your question, climate change is absolutely critical and uh, it gets too little uh, attention in the water sector. And also, uh, we had a core meeting just earlier today and at the hydrology group and uh, I believe we need to connect much better and also utilize the, the enormous amount of funding which is, which is pledged in climate change adaptation. We talk about many billions. Huh? That was a long, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Maybe you just shout or... <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, interesting uh, talk. Uh, I would like to connect, however, this to our discussions at IG that we have. So we, uh, around a year ago, we had the ver first version of the strategy that was devoted purely to one SDG 6. And SDG 6 is called Clean Water Sanitation. However, however, it was renamed, and also in many of your slides, into Water and Sanitation. Because the original formulation is about water, basically, right? Clean Water and Sanitation. So it's about how humans consume water. It's not about floods, it's not about the infrastructure, it's not about hydropower. So it's about quite narrow, however, very important aspect of life. So discussion we have now that perhaps we should sort of better connect to SDGs as they're formulated. However, our structures are different from SDGs. So the question is, should we indeed sort of restructure into uh, more SDG-related topics? Or, <coughs> since our topic areas are serving many SDGs, practically each of them, say hydrology, serves many of these SDGs, and if you take other uh, research areas or educational areas, they also serve many of these SDGs. And so we form a matrix at that, where we work along research lines and we serve many SDGs at the same time. So could you reflect on this? Should we indeed sort of think of restructuring along SDGs, or we better simply think how our existing research areas contribute to these SDGs and how we could help Well, thank you. I, I think as former vice rector, I should stay away of giving advice or restructuring IG. <laughs> I had these discussions so many times, but I, um, uh, so I avoid making comments on the structure of IG, but in like terms of core groups and departments, and I avoid that. But in terms of research lines and activities, I believe what you call the matrix structure, if I understood your question right, is, is very true. You know, take take. Um, Flood, flood warning, you know, a number of groups work in that field here at IG, the, the River Basin Group, the Hydromatics Group, the Hydrology Group, and, and others as well. But that contributes to a number of SDGs, so it's of course uh, SDG 6 and different aspects of SDG 6, but also the city's goal, you know, there's something on, on victims and uh, uh, ecosystems and also uh, preventing damage of infrastructure then uh, economic growth because of you know I don't need to explain it. so I think you can tick a number of box boxes with this kind of one example of working on, on uh, flood forecasting for instance yeah? and, and that is true for probably everything so it's very important to demonstrate first be, be cutting edge be very good what you do in high impact for development and then demonstrate how that links to quite a number of other goals I, th I think that would be my my recommendation Not using the number is just showing me that the number of projects built in the world. 
but it's not showing me how many people are using it. So many toilets showing in the way. Like if it will be moldable to uh, include all these characters as the work is progressing or again it was the given we have new SVG goals we include that on. I hope I understood your uh, question right. Um, the, the data that uh, the joint monitoring program from WHO and UNICEF is using is coming from the uh, large part from the uh, what is called domestic health survey. And there, there's some other data and, and census data from countries. They, uh, um, there are surveys done in, in the, in, for many things and also the, the sanitation behavior. So it's not only counting toilets, it's also uh, having access to toilets, is it a shared facility, what kind of, is it improved or not improved, you know, it's kind of a fairly detailed uh, monitoring of uh, what people do. So I, I don't think it's only counting number of toilets, that's maybe one response to you. And the second one, I also don't believe that certain technology, like the toilet which we enjoy here in, in Western countries, is necessarily replicable around the world or just something you parachute some toilets and then the problem is solved. No, no, it's, it's a, it has much more to do with this cultural, social acceptance. Uh, you know, it's, it's a much more complicated thing than, than just uh, toilets. So it, it's, it's the whole sanitation behavior, including its uh, cultural, societal uh, the, um, aspects of it. Oh, it's from 2018. It's Fred Hattermann from PIC in Potsdam Climate Institute. Uh, it, the, the, the number disappeared, sorry. This must be using the same Thank you. I'm, I'm very interested in that we're putting together the water and climate change World Water Development Report as we speak. It will be published next March and the uh, first draft is ready in June. And uh, I, I would be most interested to see the latest data. This, but this is a, is a one year old publication, yeah. so it's not. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to learn. <laughs> Thank you. Michael. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's fascinating that you, you've come from the IAG community and now you're leading this part of, uh, of UNESCO and you've told us you're, you're, you're out in the world, you're talking to policymakers, decision makers. I know you're also really circulating among the, the, the highest levels of water expertise and leaders in different countries. I just wonder if you've had any observations about the capacity at that level and strengths and weaknesses. I don't, I'm not sure if something stands out from your experiences, but do you have any sense that that what would help most is greater technical expertise in particular areas among the people you interact with, or is it more of a more integrated, higher level understanding of water and development among the people you're interacting with? And you're, and you're trying to communicate simplified but still complex ideas in your presentations? No, it's a very complex question. Thanks, Michael. But, uh, well, just I, more I, specializations or more integration? <laughs> <laughs> is the question what is needed more or what do I observe in my counterparts? What, what you observe that, 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 that could be improved. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, we need improvements everywhere. but. What I, I call it before a game changer that we from this kind of pure focus on water supply and sanitation have a more comprehensive uh, looking at, at water as a goal with many aspects, water quality, scarcity, uh, you know, even some aspects are missing, flooding is not explicitly there, and I agree, but it's a kind of, there, there is a, a development, but probably um, these simple messages that water is, is an enabler for so many other goals and also progress in so many other things is important to make progress in water development. Uh, th that is 
too little understood and it's uh, even I am often on storytelling examples you know we need to, and maybe more research is needed applied research is needed to, to uh, really quantify that what does that mean for Lake Chad or for uh, a reforestation effort in Ethiopia or uh, for a mangrove uh, system in, in a delta somewhere in the tropics but uh, you know in, in, in really showing how ecosystems water jobs for the people the, you know, earn their livelihoods and stuff. How that really connects and very quantitatively, not only in storytelling. That you know, and I, I think that that's missing, and also that people kind of <coughs> get this. Uh, this integration is often not there. Maybe because of all the education, most people I, when I, mean, I speak at that level, are from a classical education. They don't have a T shape. You know, they have just a, the I shape. <laughs> this was an insider joke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, the kind of a very classical uh, education in civil engineering or in ecology or whatever. I think that the integration, I, uh, I think, is underutilized. Yeah. People need to go yeah, to the lectures, I, I feel. There's uh. more <laughs> questions. Then uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for the uh, presentation. Uh, there were a lot of interesting links to also uh, things that we have on our minds internally in IG. So I hope that it is also some uh, food for thought and uh, further deliberation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, let's see you again soon.